My flight was delayed by over an hour due to what the airline described as a minor technical issue. I have an aversion to flying anyway, so this didn't do much to boost my confidence. At any rate, it was a pleasant surprise to me that we, after an unusually bumpy flight, landed safely. With a sigh of relief, I walked out of the terminal building on a hot Florida afternoon and eventually got into the large air-conditioned limousine that was waiting for me. Although the thought of having to make the return trip in just a day or two was twirling somewhere in the back of my mind, I had more important things on my mind at the moment. I was once again very nervous as I climbed out of the car outside the hotel. I was in an unfamiliar city, in a country I had only seen in movies and on television. Unfortunately, mostly crime shows. Not the kind of programs that give you confidence in your safety when visiting these places. Especially if, like me, you don't travel much. Anyway, as I got out of the car, I was somewhat relieved to find that Paul and Della recognized me immediately and spoke to me. Hi, Mike. We weren't sure you'd make it in time. We'll get the luggage and send it to the room. Now you better get going. She's waiting in the lobby, Della said. Paul gave me a brief nod of greeting and headed to the back of the car to get my suitcase from the driver. I must admit, I hadn't expected the place to be so grand. The hotel lobby was gigantic, and there seemed to be several hundred people wandering everywhere. In reality, there were probably no more than 30 or 40. How the hell do they expect me to find a woman I've never seen in my life, God only knows? I asked myself as an extremely attractive woman suddenly appeared in front of me dressed in a small red, obviously designer, cocktail dress, and holding a matching clutch in her left hand. Mike? she asked with a charming smile. Uh, yes, Holly? I whispered back, somewhat stunned by her unexpected beauty. Under the circumstances, Holly was not what I had expected. Holly smiled again, but surprised me even more by hugging me and kissing me on the cheek. Overcoming the initial shock, I summoned up all my courage and returned the favor. Sorry, it must be an English thing. We don't usually hug women we've never met before. By then, though, Holly and I had been emailing each other for months and talking to each other on the phone more than once in preparation for this little encounter. I really didn't know what to expect. Did you have a good flight? She asked. No, Holly, I don't need any more flights, I replied, then explained. A few years ago, I was involved in a very rough landing. In fact, it wasn't far from a crash. The airplane made a real mess, but I think the local scrap metal dealers were pleased. At any rate, it kind of shattered my confidence in air transportation. Had I known that such a beautiful lady would meet me here and I'd be lucky enough to spend an entire evening with her, then maybe the flight wouldn't have been so bad. Thank you. I'm very flattered that such a handsome gentleman would pay me such a compliment. It's not flattery, Holly. In fact, I find you so beautiful that I have to wonder how we ever got into this situation in the first place. I don't know if it was embarrassment or nervousness that made me sway like that. In retrospect, I usually never talked to a woman or flirted the way I did with Holly for the next two hours. Notice, looking back at what I actually said, I have to admit that most of the time I was talking absolute nonsense. My mother always said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Maybe some people's eyes don't see what others see, Holly replied. I'm sorry, but I found the last few months very depressing except for our correspondence. Holly smiled. I thought the whole thing would really upset you. Oh, don't think so, Holly. It was only in the beginning. But then I enjoyed our little emails and chats, and it became so necessary that I was really looking forward to it. Honestly, for weeks now, I've been looking forward to coming here and meeting in person. Holly. I looked her over from head to toe. If I'd known how beautiful you were, it's a hell of a surprise. I still don't understand why you chose me. And who better than 34-year-old Mike Crosby, married to Avril? Holly grimaced. For ten years now. They don't have kids. Rumor has it it's Avril's choice. Mike is a maintenance manager at a hospital near where they live. He hates that job, by the way. God, you're so thorough, I exclaimed. No, not me, Mike, but the people I hire. I have some pictures of you. Holly's face flashed with a questioning expression for a second, and another thing. You look really smart in them. 
Maybe those pictures are the reason I chose you as my secret lover tonight. She smiled at me and winked slightly. I think you're flattering me, Holly, I replied, smiling. Fortunately, at that moment, we were interrupted by Paul and Della, the couple who had met me outside the hotel coming over to join us. The boy took the luggage to the room. Mike, now are you both ready for the big show? Paul asked. We always are. How about you, Holly? I asked, throwing the ball in her court. Yeah, I think I'm ready, she replied. I looked somewhat reticent, considering we were going through this whole charade at her insistence. Look, Holly, you know you don't have to do this. Once we get in there, you'll realize there's no turning back. I can even go in there myself if you want. Don't be silly, Mike. That would defeat the purpose of the drill, wouldn't it? Do you really think I came all the way from Montreal to miss out on the fun? Come on, be brave. So, shall we go? Holly said, taking my hand. But then she looked at Paul and asked, Intimate enough? I guess I should have felt awkward, but for some reason I didn't. Come on, guys, married or not, you all know what it feels like when a beautiful woman gets a little closer than she really should. We all have instincts that can, if you let them, take over in circumstances like this. My baser natural instincts definitely took over. Although I was very nervous, I couldn't think of any reason to try to control them. Yeah, come on, guys. You two lovers, you're having a secret date away from your spouses. Make it look right replied Della in a voice like a movie director. Without my permission, Holly put her left arm around my waist and her right arm around my waist. Then she pressed herself very close to me. Normally, I would have thought close to the point of awkwardness. Yeah, here's the ticket. Go ahead and try it and don't forget all those gooey eyes. Della giggled. It won't be that hard, I replied, looking at Holly beside me. Hey, watch out, Holly. Looks like our Mike is out here on the hunt, Della commented. Holly didn't answer, or rather couldn't answer because when I looked down at her, she caught me off guard again and kissed me on the lips. Sorry, Mike, she said, sensing my embarrassment. I should have asked, but I need to make sure my lipstick is convincingly smeared. Holly, when you want to smudge your lipstick, don't ask. Maybe I should apply for a full-time job as a lipstick smudger. I said, and kissed her. Yeah, well, it's not every day you get a chance to kiss a woman as beautiful as Holly. Married or not, I'm only human. Sorry to interrupt you guys, but are we doing this or not? Because if you want, we can skip right to the bedroom scene. Della laughed. Maybe later on, Holly whispered to me, giggling, before tugging lightly on my waist and dragging me in the direction of the hotel lobby. Despite all her demonstrative bravado, I could sense that Holly was almost as nervous as I was, so I took the remark as nervous chatter. Entering the living room was a bit of a disappointment, really. The place was pretty crowded, but I'll add that I noticed a few guys showing much more than mild interest in the stunning woman in the little red cocktail dress snuggled against my side. Not that I could blame them. I was having a hell of a hard time not looking at the incredible cleavage Holly was showing off in that dress. I think I strutted around looking as important as the cat that ate the canary. It had been a long time since I had been so proud of the woman I was escorting. Paul and Della took the lead and we followed them to a table against the wall. The waiter came over and we ordered our drinks, and I found sitting with my back to most of this room uncomfortable because I could only stare at the stage where a small orchestra was playing. I actually wanted to scrutinize everyone in the place, but that might give the game away. Our drinks arrived and the four of us made small talk, mostly about my delayed flight. This isn't good. I think we're going to have to up the ante, Paul said. Didn't they see us? Holly asked. Too immersed in themselves. I don't think they've said a word to the others since we came in. Go on, you two. Mind your own business. I held out my hand and Holly took it as we both stood up. I have to warn you, Holly, that I'm not Gene Kelly. I warned her. I'm sure you can handle it, love. Holly replied with a grin. Love? I asked. <laughs> but that's what you're supposed to be tonight, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's a damn shame we have to play these silly games, isn't it? Who's playing? Holly said, winking at me, wrapping both arms around my neck and pulling me to her. I wish, 
I thought to myself. God, if the guys in the office could see me now. It was already the third set since we'd arrived, and they were playing slower. Oh my God, did I really do that? Holly asked, squeezing into me. I'm sorry, but desirable women usually do that to me, I replied, blushing slightly. I can't say we actually danced, literally. We just swayed in the same spot, slowly twirling around. I have to say it was one of the most enjoyable dances I've had in years. Suddenly, another couple pushed us slightly. You've been spotted, Paul whispered. Be careful, you might look the wrong way. Concentrate on the dance. I looked at Holly again, who was smiling charmingly back at me. Holly, you're one hell of an actress, I thought to myself. You know, I hope the balloon doesn't go up too soon. I like that, I told her. I can feel it, love, she said with a cheeky grin and then pressed herself even tighter against me. I wonder, Holly, if you have sadistic tendencies, I remarked, smiling. I like to tease, Mike. This evening was the best joke I could think of. I don't know what expression appeared on my face, but it made Holly laugh out loud. I only wished I really was the person she was really teasing, but I knew the good Lord could never look at me so favorably. Oh, don't look so dejected, Mike. After all, you don't have to rush back to the UK, do you? We can always take a few days to enjoy the Florida sunshine. Now that we've been spotted, let's make it look really good. Next thing I know, Holly's head is resting on my shoulder and she's chewing on my neck and earlobe. Hey, take it easy, girl, or I'll have an accident, I warned. Holly giggled back and, more importantly, didn't stop her manipulations. She doubled down on them for that matter. Much to my relief, the band's performance ended before I lost control and we returned to our table. Holly was walking, holding my hand and dragging me along behind her. When we got closer... Paul gestured for us to sit down, but his eyes were fixed on something that was happening across the room. That's right. He's on his way. When he comes over, you can stand there and argue with him, but don't raise your hand at him, Mike. We can handle any rough stuff. That's what we're paid to do, Paul said, stepping forward. Is she coming? I asked. No. You know I don't think she realized it was you. That's if she saw you at all. She was standing with her back to the dance floor but she's watching intently now, so she'll probably spot you as soon as you stand up and turn around. What the hell is going on here, Holly? What are you doing here, and what the hell are you playing with that asshole? Who is he anyway? Asked an angry voice from somewhere not far from my left shoulder. I stood up and turned to face the guy. Holly was dancing with that asshole, just like you no doubt danced with my wife. Well, yeah. At that moment, that was the best I could think of. I didn't know what I was going to say when the confrontation started. Holly, on the other hand, who also stood up, had obviously rehearsed her little speech well. And he'll probably have me later while you're sleeping with his wife in room 642. By the way, we have 643 right across the hall, but we'll try not to make as much noise as you two did last night. Holly said with a smile on her face and put her arm around my shoulders. I really could have done without Holly at that moment, because her husband, who was much bigger than I thought he was, might well have pounced on me, and Holly hanging on to me limited my maneuvering. But I really didn't have to worry about him. Avril's appearance on stage, I suppose after she'd spotted me as soon as I stood up, was much more, uh, exciting. Honestly, Avril came out of nowhere and hit me in the forehead, obviously on the run. Effectively knocking Holly's husband off his feet, she pushed him out of the way. In a way, it was convenient because it took away some of Avril's momentum. Holly's husband lay down on some poor woman's lap before he fell to the floor. Notice I didn't see this. I was lying on the floor myself, looking at my very angry wife. I think the fall to the floor shook Avril up a bit, as it did me. Anyway, she ended up lying on top of me, looking me in the face. What the hell were you doing with that slut? She asked demandingly. Dancing, as you can see, I replied, still without the jazzy cuteness. It looks like you were trying to sleep with her, she objected. Come on, Avril, I just got here. I haven't had a chance yet. You've been sleeping with her husband for at least the last two days. I was pleased with myself. I had taken my first good shot. Ia. But don't be so stupid, Mike, 
Where did you get this stupid idea? Avril said, rolling off me and sitting up. How did you even get here? You don't fly, do you? Yes, but not when I want to catch my wife with her lover. I replied. I was getting good at this back and forth stuff. That's bullshit, Mike. You know I'm here on a business trip. Avril, your business trip was to Houston. It's freaking Florida. You and your company have no business being here in Miami. You had a meeting in Houston, and then you flew here, and you've spent the last two nights horizontal tangoing with that creep in room 643. 642 lover. 643 is our room. Holly's voice corrected me from somewhere. Yes, sorry. Room 642. Do you want to see the tapes, Avril? I asked. I had no idea if Holly had any tapes from this trip, but I knew that she had many from their previous dates. I figured Avril wouldn't really want to see them. Avril just sat on the floor and looked at me. I have to admit that this was the first time I had ever seen this woman speechless. No, not like that. I remember the first time I slept with her before we were even married. By the time I was done with her, she was lying there speechless. I always thought I'd shaken all the chatter out of her. Well, it wasn't a disappointment to her. She came back for more the next night and eventually married me. What a shame. Suddenly, someone's hands helped us to our feet, and the next thing I really realized, besides Holly's arm around my waist again, was Paul saying, Morgan Ardent, you're served. And he handed Holly's rather disheveled husband an envelope. I wonder what I missed that made Morgan so disheveled. Paul then quickly did the same to Avril. Although our British divorce petitions don't really have to be presented as formally as the Yanks do, I could send them by registered mail, I guess. Holly and I just figured it would add a bit of spice if it was done officially and at the same time as the papers were handed to her husband. The two guys who followed the two lovers along with the rest of the company were then handed the papers. Holly took care of everything. Avril and Morgan worked for an American company, so we both sued her in the American courts for turning a blind eye to what was going on with the couple. Their bosses, who were served papers, had their girlfriends too, so I think the bloody company must have turned a blind eye to everything. Eventually, Paul filed a lawsuit against Morgan Ardent for alienation of affection, which Holly's lawyers filed precisely in the American courts on my behalf. It had been years since anyone had successfully done such a thing in the UK. It ended as abruptly as it began. I really have no idea where or when Avril disappeared. Holly said she was led away in tears by one of her boss's girlfriends, but I didn't see her leave. I did, however, see Holly's husband being led away by two guys. Notice, not before he threw me a look that I thought should have turned me to stone. So what now? I asked Holly. We're dancing. She responded with a smile and dragged me to the dance floor again. The rest of the evening turned into a bit of a party. I have no idea at what time the party ended. I'm afraid I had too much to drink myself. But I do remember a conversation we overheard in the elevator. One of the hotel staff was telling a couple how lucky they were because the hotel was full. But for some reason, the couple in 642 had suddenly checked out. The housekeeping staff was still in room 642 when Holly, Paul, Della, and I entered room 643. Too bad. It takes away from the rest of the fun of the evening, Holly said. I couldn't wait to see their faces when we walked out of that room together in the morning. Maybe it's not such a bad thing. It might give their lawyers leverage in court, Paul commented. Paul, I have enough information on what these two have been doing for the last six months to get two divorces. Besides, I have the prenup that my father insisted on. He never thought much of Morgan. Yeah, but what about Mike? They don't have prenuptial agreements in the UK. I'm still screwed, Paul. My lawyer thinks it's going to be 50-50. The only light in the sky is that Avril makes more money than me. I said, yeah, I think heads are about to fly in this company and Morgan and Avril will be first on the list. My uncle is a major shareholder and he's already on the case, Holly informed us. I had a hard time slowing him down or we would have missed out on today's fun. There wasn't really that much going on, not a lot of fireworks. Quite an expense on your part, Holly, for something that could have been done at home, I said, voicing my thoughts. Ah, Mike, the look on Morgan's face when you said he slept with your wife was classic. He had no idea who you were. 
Did I say that? No, not in those words. You're too much of a gentleman. But I did. And the look on Morgan's face when he realized he hadn't caught me, I had, or rather we had caught them, was something special. And then Avril burst through like a defender at the finish line. The funniest thing I've seen in a long time, Holly said and laughed out loud. God knows how long we chatted about nothing in particular, but eventually made it to bed. Oh, I better remind you that room 643 was a suite. I had one bedroom and Holly had the other. When we went to bed, Paul and Della were sitting in the living room. When we got up in the morning, they were sitting there. Apparently, Paul was a court officer. I have no idea what that means. But I realized that the American courts would take his words almost as gospel, meaning he could swear that Holly and I didn't spend the night in the same bed. So, Mike, what's your plan now? Holly asked me at breakfast. I'm not sure. I'm going home to lick my wounds. I answered. Well, the lovers are gone. Why don't you and I fly to Vegas for a few days before you come home? That's a good idea, Holly, but I'm going back to the UK. I'm sorry, but adding another flight to Las Vegas is not my idea of a good time. Holly sat there, quite obviously thinking for a few moments. Flying upsets you that much, doesn't it? Okay, alternative idea. A close friend of mine has a house in the Bahamas. Why don't we go there for a few days? Don't worry. We can go by boat and you won't even have to risk me driving. I had to think about it, but not for very long. After crossing the Atlantic, it would have been silly to fly straight to the UK, considering I had almost two weeks of summer vacation left. I had to get back home because there was bound to be a real old ding-dong. The house was already on the market, and I'd converted everything to cash so she wouldn't empty all the joint accounts. Keep in mind that even though my lawyer oversaw all the changes I made, I still thought I was going to screw up. It was his job to keep me from going completely broke. Yeah, why not? A good ferry cruise should be fun. But can you just show up at your friends' houses uninvited? Of course, I have a standing invitation. I don't visit them as often as I should. What about dragging me along? Oh, they'll probably love you more than Morgan. They never thought much of him, Holly replied with a chuckle. What can I say? The cab dropped us off at what looked to me like a rather fancy boat or even a private yacht. It turned out to be some kind of charter fishing boat, and it had impressive acceleration. During the trip to the Bahamas, Holly spent most of her time sunbathing on deck in a tiny bikini. I spent time on the bridge, where the captain was supposedly showing me how to steer the boat, while we were actually gazing at Holly's slender body. Daddy, said Holly, hugging the old man who met us on the quay. This is Mike, that was his wife Morgan was playing with. Holly said, introducing us. Hi, son, he said, shaking my hand and then Holly's. I told you you could never trust that little shit, but no, you always thought you knew better. All right, Mike, let's get you home and change into something appropriate. I realized that my business suit was not considered appropriate attire for the Bahamas. At the house, a large rambling structure that bore little resemblance to homes I'd been to before, I met Holly's mother, who greeted me like a long-lost son. Shame on my reserved English nature. When Holly's father escorted me to my room, though, things got a little official. Let's just say he made sure I understood where my room was, and that's where he and his wife expected me to sleep. You get the idea. The next four days were really enjoyable. When Holly and I weren't sunbathing or swimming in the pool, I was either fishing off the boat with Holly's dad, or we were at numerous cocktail parties in the evenings. At two of them, Holly danced with me, but she was somewhat more chaste than she had been that first night at the Miami Hotel. On the last night before we left, Holly and I were finishing an evening stroll along the beach in the moonlight. We weren't in each other's arms, but she was holding my hand. We talked about how upset I was that my divorce was going to cost me the house I'd spent so many years remodeling to my taste. Avril always let me do whatever I wanted with the house, she just picked out the color scheme and everything. The extension and even the kitchen and bathrooms were always in my plan, as was my garage and workshop. God, how I'm going to miss that workshop. Mike, I want to apologize, Holly said suddenly. Apologize for what, Holly? Well, that first night in Miami, I got a little ahead of myself. Holly, we were both very nervous about what was going to happen. 
I think we both drank a little more than we should have and said some things we shouldn't have. It served as a cover for our nervousness. That's all we have to worry about. I know. But I'd hate for you to think that I would flirt with someone like that. Shit, don't be silly, girl. I understand perfectly well. I have to apologize. I really didn't control myself like I should have. Yeah, I noticed, big boy. Anyway, we're not the kind of people who give in to our baser instincts like Morgan and Avril, are we? Absolutely not, Holly. We've been together for almost five days, and we haven't even kissed since that first night. Why do you think that is? I'm not really sure. You're a very attractive woman, and I enjoyed being your official lipstick. But we have to take into consideration that in a way we are both on what you could call a rebound. How many relationships are known that would have lasted normally when they started under these circumstances? Yes, I have to admit that they usually result in heartache for everyone at the end, Holly said quietly. Besides, we're still married, Holly, even if our spouses seem to have overlooked that fact. Yes, you're right. We're above that kind of behavior, aren't we? Unfortunately, I replied, does that mean you can't smudge my lipstick at least once before you leave? Holly, like I said, I'm pretty damn sure I'd be happy to apply for a full-time job as your lipstick smudger. Okay, I spent the next half hour or so watching Holly's lipstick smudge. By the time we got back to her parents' house, however, we were acting like rank good friends. The next day, the same boat took us back to the mainland with even more speed than before. Then Holly walked me to the airport for my flight back to the UK. Come on. I smeared Holly's lipstick again before getting on the plane. When I finally got back to the house, Avril was already waiting for me. Surprisingly, there weren't many fireworks. Hi, sorry, Mike, I messed up, didn't I? Said a very depressed Avril when I found her sitting in the kitchen. I just can't understand why, Avril. I thought we had a good thing going here. Yeah, Mike, I just got caught up in my work. I'm really sorry that all of this came to me. I really didn't mean to cheat on you or anything. God, Mike, I still love you. Yeah, so how do you feel about him? Hell, please don't ask. He flattered and seduced me. I acted like a stupid little schoolgirl. Did you, uh, you know, with his wife? Avril, eh, was all I had to say. Hell, I might have known you wouldn't do that. Now you're gonna tell me we don't stand a chance, aren't you? You know me better than I know myself, Avril. When do you want me to move out? Or will you? Provided you don't bring any of your lovers here, Avril, we can both live here until the house is sold. That will give us both time to find some decent accommodation. And the divorce? I'm willing to change the grounds to irreconcilable differences, provided we can come to an amicable agreement on finances. That should get us a quick divorce. Take the papers and show me where to sign, Mike. I messed up, so I won't give you any more trouble, Avril said humbly. That's how it really was. The divorce went through within a few months. It didn't take long to sell the house. It had been on the market for less than two months when a real estate agent came along and bought it on behalf of his client. Strange guy never struck me as a real estate agent. At any rate, we never even saw the buyers or knew their names. After much negotiation, he even bought almost all the furniture. I was moving into rented furnished accommodation and Avril, having been fired by her employer, suddenly found herself being hunted by another American company. She left England for California before the divorce was even finalized. I don't know, maybe two months later I got a call from the agent of the people who bought our house. It seems my client is having some trouble controlling the central heating system, Mr. Crosby. We were wondering if you could kindly pop in to see them this evening and explain how to do it, he asked. I don't see why they would have any problems. It's a pretty standard system. But then again, that damn electronic timer is a bit of a crapshoot to get your head around. Yeah, tell them I'll stop by tonight on my way home from work and see if there's anything I can do to help. By the way, what are their names? I asked. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. I'll tell them to expect you around half past seven. Goodbye. He replied, and the connection went dead. That's strange. I remember thinking, how the hell did he know I was getting there at half past seven? That was the time I always came home from work when I lived there, and the bastard hung up on me without giving me his name. The garden looked pretty much the same when I turned into the driveway.
That's if you ignore the little sign proudly informing everyone that the new homeowner was using some local gardening company to mow the lawns, etc. There were no cars in the driveway, so I parked in my old spot. With a heavy heart, I walked to the front door and pressed the bell button. It's very strange, you know, coming back to the house you used to live in and finding that you have to ring the doorbell instead of just putting the key in the lock and walking in. Who is it? came from behind the closed door. Mike Crosby, I shouted back. I came in to explain the heating system. I could hear all the locks and deadbolts I had installed on that door with my own hands being pushed back and opened. Most of them were for when we went to bed or left the house empty. I never expected anyone to use them all the time. Finally, the door opened, and a girl of about 18 opened the door and invited me in. The landlady is waiting in the living room. The girl said it very precisely, as if she had rehearsed the line. Then she giggled and ran into the kitchen. After knocking, I opened the living room door. I'm Mike Crosby. I believe you're having some trouble with the central heating, I said to the woman with her back to me, looking out into the garden behind the house. No, the heating is working fine, Mike. What I'm really looking for is someone to smear my lipstick on, she said, turning and coming into my arms. Epilogue. It's funny how things can turn out, but I never got to spend another night alone in my apartment. Holly and I got married less than two months later. I no longer work at the hospital. I am now a joint representative for Holly's father, along with Holly, in the UK and Europe. This guy gets involved in everything he can think of. To be honest, I'm a bit of a mess most of the time, although I do pick up a few things from Holly as I go along. Not that there's much to do there other than represent. I get the feeling that Holly's dad just wants to make sure I can afford to keep Holly the way she's used to. Anyway, in a few months, Holly's gonna have to stop chasing me all over Europe. Well, you can't carry a baby around with you, can you? No, I still wouldn't fly if I could. Honestly, life since we've been married has been like one long car vacation. A very nice one in a brand new Beamer. What do people call it? Oh yes, I think I fell on my feet and also fell in love with one of the most beautiful women in the world. Most nights when we go away, we spend in luxury hotels. I've realized that the nights are more exhausting than the driving, as I've found Holly to be insatiable at times. God only knows how Morgan found the strength to sleep with Avril. But Holly insists that I'm much better than Morgan in that regard. Perhaps he never gave Holly and her needs as much attention as she deserved. Mind you, sometimes I think my new wife has a really twisted sense of humor. One morning, I was coming out of our home bathroom and saw Holly saying thank you to a picture she had hidden in one of the dresser drawers. Then she looked very embarrassed when she realized I had seen it. I, of course, asked who was in the picture. You won't believe this, it's a portrait of your ex-wife Avril, Holly replied with a smile. Well, Mike, you have to admit that if Avril hadn't let Morgan talk her into bed with him, I never would have found you, would I? I'll always have a soft spot for her, you know? Yes, that's a different way of looking at things. I walked over to the dresser and picked up the picture. Thank you, Avril. I never would have thought that the way you run around me and cheat on me would eventually lead me to such happiness, I said. Then I put the picture back in the drawer and turned my attention back to the woman who really mattered to me. It must have been almost lunchtime when we went out for some fresh air again and went downstairs for breakfast. God, was I really that tired? Life goes on, 